All right, guys, what's up? Recap video for uh, Lake Cania. So, ended up coming ninth at Lake Cania, which is pretty cool. I was um, I was hoping for a better result. I can't complain. I got a top ten finish, which is really really cool. But I was kind of after coming third last year and um, of quite a quite a similar technique as to what was working this year, I was really hoping for a little bit better, maybe hoping to be up there within the top five, especially with the fish that I caught a couple of weeks ago. I was um, hoping for a little bit better than nine, but there was definitely a lot more bigger fish caught than what I thought was going to be. Uh, I spoke to Steve Morgan on the drive up on a phone interview and um, kind of just ran through a few things as to what I thought was going to win but um, at the same time not trying to give too much away. He did ask if I thought it was going to be one on spoons and I, I said no, I don't think it was. Um, what I found a couple of weeks prior when I was fishing is that a lot of the bigger fish were coming in really shallow water. Um, if I could find some nice healthy patches of weed in literally anything less than about six feet of water. A lot of the place that I fished was kind of only about four or five feet, um, but it did have some nice healthy weed. The weed, it was and it wasn't hard to find. My dog is doing some weird stuff, I don't know what he's doing. but. Uh, talking about the weed, um, I spent a couple of uh, weekends up at Cania pre-fishing it, trying to crack a pattern. Um, it seemed, I, f I could find a lot of fish schooling up on just about any point. It seemed to be in kind of like the, the back stretch. Cania kind of has, I guess, the main basin at the front and then it hooks around to go up to the back. So it's kind of really like a, like a second main basin, kind of. And I was, I focused a lot of time up there. Um, I did, I caught a couple of fish off jerk baits and stuff in the trees just a little bit before. Uh, one of my, my a cracker I caught in pre-fish was on a jerk bait there. Uh, but then that kind of died off. So where I focused my efforts is basically where I caught them last year. Um, so I caught them last year, there's kind of a middle island to the left. Um, it's not really an island anymore because Cania kind of has dropped a little bit, so what was a couple feet underwater is now just land. Um, but on the left hand side of this, there's a bay and I found that um, I was fishing the blades a little bit different. I was fishing with a blade, again that pink Eco Gear ZX40 did the job remarkably, colour 441 and funnily enough Cania is where this whole pink blade saga began last year off the, off the back of a third place at Cania. Uh, I kind of just went back to what I knew, fishing maroon dam and stuff with blades. Basically I'd cast the blade out and uh, because it runs two assists on the back of the Eco Gear blades, it's really easy to work through the weed. So I would just roll it back through and when it would ping off off the, the weed, the fish would come and smash it. It was a little bit different this time around. I did try that technique, it wasn't working. Um, but then off the back of St. Clair, uh, last round, developing that new style that I see the Americans do, that I, I don't really see too many Aussies, Aussies do it here. I don't know if I'm the only one or, or what, but I tried to employ and design kind of a new technique. I mean, you're kind of trying to reinvent the wheel. Everyone knows how to hop a blade and hop a plastic, but I don't call this technique like a hop. It's more like a rip. Um, so I don't know if you've, people who are watching it, if they've ice jigged or not. When you're ice jigging, it's really short, sharp hops off the bottom. This technique I do with the blade is, is very similar to that. I would cast it out, same as St. Clair, I'd cast it out and I'd let it hit the bottom but I would keep slack in my line. It's really important to keep that slack in my line because then when I, I, I quickly rip it and quickly pop it, it's only lifting maybe a foot or less than a foot off the bottom. So really essentially the lure is just doing that but 
on the way down, you know, I'm only fishing in shallow water and throwing a ZX40, which is about a five gram lure or something like that, I think, which, yes, is a bit heavy for that shallow water, but what it's doing is every time it's, it's hitting the bottom, it's creating a big puff of mud or silt on the bottom, and I think that's what the fish were reacting to. So it was a very similar bite for me as what I found at St. Clair. They would pick it up off the bottom and just run with it. So I was dicing around with that idea in pre-fish and found that that was going to be the plan for me um, that I was hoping I, I could actually win with. I know a lot of people wouldn't be throwing blades and I kind of thought a lot of people wouldn't be targeting really, really shallow water. Um, I thought a lot of people would be throwing spoons or, or, or targeting some deeper fish being it was still the days were quite warm at Cania. Um, it was definitely a lot warmer than the last couple of years at Cania, where it's been pretty like ice cold and into the negatives. Um, but, you know, that's what I found and that's what I was sticking with. I knew I wasn't going to be catching a lot of fish. I wasn't necessarily making it a grind for me, I was just going for broke. And this was either going to make or break me. Um, because I wasn't catching quantity, I was catching quality. And the quality I was catching of the fish prior, you know, I weighed a five fish bag for, I think it was about six and a half to seven kilos. Like, I don't know, I can't remember what it was, but it was somewhere between six and a half and seven kilos for five fish a couple of weeks ago on that technique. So I was really confident that that's a great bag and that honestly, I really, really thought that I had a shot at winning. I didn't realize that there was that many big fish getting around. You know, all of the top 10 weighed some big, big weights. I kind of thought it might've been the top five when I was wrong. Um, but a lot of people caught them shallow. Uh, Maddie Johnson, who ended up winning, MJ found the same thing as me. He was finding that the shallower weed, he was throwing jerk baits, that was holding the bigger fish. I think he caught a little bit more fish than me, but um, that was what I worked out and that was my plan. So, day one, it was all about going back to those areas that I'd found them. Again, I had found a lot of schools hanging out on points and sort of like that second basin, but those fish were not responding at all. Those fish were following my boat. I think I talked about in, in the St. Clair video, you know, I run, I run two sounders with two separate transducers. So up the front of my, de of my uh, 2D, sorry, from my Mencoda, I can see what's happening under me at the front, but I've got it linked to the transducer that I see at the back under my, under my jacking plate. So I can see what's going on up the front and a couple meters down the back. And I found that a lot of those schools that I did find the fish were not active. They were sitting quite low in the water and they were following the arse of my boat. And what I found when bass follow the arse of your boat around, they're not responsive. It's when they're responsive over the length of your boat. If I can see that they're responding to stuff up the front and up the back, then I'm pretty happy with, with that fish. But if I can see heaps of fish down the back of my boat and none on my front sound from up the front, then they're just following the shadow and it's you mark them and keep them in the back of your mind but probably don't waste too much time on them. Just because they're there doesn't mean they're going to eat. And you can you can waste a lot of time on shut down fish. That's why you just got a spot hop. But I was using those as backups because shallow was my deal. Shallow was what I thought was going to work. So Yes, day one, I, I found a spot late in pre-fish day, uh, the day before, that was nice, healthy weed, what I was looking for, that I, really, I found really quite late in the day. And uh, I was with Trent, I think Trent pulled up some nice fish and a big yellow belly, and I was like, cool, this area is nice and healthy, I was looking for this healthy weed, because what happened from a couple of weeks ago, um, the water dropped a little bit. I think we had a little bit of a cold snap come through. A lot of that nice weed that you could see with your eyes from the top, that had died off. Now, I wear Costas, guys. Um, Costa Sunnies are phenomenal, and it really helps me see and cut through the glare of the water. So I could see 
where in my costas that what was green weed a couple weeks prior was now brown and it was dead and it wasn't cool. You want nice healthy weed that I went through on my pre-fish video, you want nice healthy weed because the healthy weed is going to bring in the bait fish and the bait fish are going to bring in your bass and other predatory species that are going to eat them. Dead weed is not providing anything for the fish, the bait fish to feed off. So it's just a dead end. I'm not saying you can't catch off dead weed, I'm just saying you want to find the nice lush green weed, you can see some bait and some fish swimming around, that's going to be your best bet. So I could see that a lot of the weed that I had found a couple of weeks prior had died off. So I was kind of worried a little bit, I was trying to find that fresh weed. The fresher weed that I could see, if you would look at a bay you would probably look straight past it because it was sitting about three feet under the water that I could see on my sounder and when I stopped and looked with my sunnies when I was on top of it, it was that nice fresh, healthy, thick weed mat that I wanted. But you couldn't see it from the top because it was sitting a couple feet under the water. So I targeted this spot, day one I did drop um, one fish in there, I think uh, a non-boater, dropped a couple as well. So it was a bit of a shaky start to the morning. I went back up to that middle island and the fish that I could see coming through on my side scan, the same as a couple of weeks ago, the same as pre-fish, the same as day one, they were monstrous fish. They were big fish, you know. When you look at side scan photos of barra in shallow water from your hummingbird side imaging, that was what these bass looked like. I could see the pectoral fins, I could see dorse, I could see every fin on these fish. They were big fish and I knew that if I could stick it out with that technique with the blade I was going to get some good ones and it, it really paid off on day one. Um, I caught all of the, not all of the fish, but I caught my big, big fish there. It was probably in a flurry of about 20 minutes and I was so happy, I was so pumped up. Unfortunately I don't have it on, on camera because I forgot this my uh, portable battery for my GoPro so I'm pretty dirty about that but I was so pumped that I knew those fish were there and I knew that I could catch them I didn't even sound out that area in pre-fish because I didn't want to disrupt it at all I didn't want to see I didn't want anybody to see me going over there I just left it blank after I caught those fish there the day was turning into a bit of a grind didn't catch anything for a long while we had four fish out of our five fish limit and I was fishing other stuff. Um, Pete dropped one at another bay that I found as well with the similar sort of structure, similar sort of shallower weedy banks that came in and I could, I could see fish coming through there as well. <clears throat> I think we put up a catfish there and, and Pete. I saw this fish and it was a good fish and it just pulled the hooks and that's what happens. We had about, it must have been about 40 minutes to go and I went back to where we started this morning because I found last year and where I went wrong last year um, in the second day um, when, I was, when I was leading, I came out, started the second day in first position. I went back out and it was foggy. Now, all these days at Cania were sunny and I think that was the mistake. I wasted too much time fishing that weed in the fog and it was a little bit, it had a little bit of fog but not nothing like it was the previous years but it didn't have sun on this particular spot where I started on day one and I think I found over the couple of weeks prior and last year I think the fish needed that sun to push up into the weed. They should have been feeding on low light in the weed, but I think it was more of a case of maybe the sun was shining on the water, the weed was their cover, and they would go up and just sit in that weed out of the sun. That's That was what I found anyway. So we went back to where we started at day one, and the sun was on it, it was great. There was some nice shady spots under that weed. Pete hooked up, got our fifth fish, and it was great. Uh, went back in, <clears throat> weighed 5.7 kilos, so not as much as what I wanted. Um, I definitely wanted, you know, what I caught a couple of weeks ago. Upwards of six, probably around six and a half was what I wanted. Um, but 5.7, 
after a tough day, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't too concerned. It was a pretty good bag, still had me sitting up there. So day two, I went out, did the same thing, fishing the same way, started off in the same spot, and day two was an absolute grind. Um, I think, honestly, from our 6.30 start in the morning, I think my weigh-in was one o'clock. 12 o'clock, I had one fish. It, I was stressed, I didn't know what to do. I'd fished all of my spots, they were not producing. I knew I had to change it up. I knew that my, my technique and my game plan wasn't holding up. The water temperature was rising. It was hot days. They, uh, they should have been sitting deep. The problem was all of the schools that I had found in deeper water were not active. They weren't chewing. <clears throat> so I didn't want to waste my time on them because I'd just gone over them for days and just got nothing. So I knew that I had to change it up with an hour left. There was a bunch of boats sitting on a school, kind of in the middle on the, on the last bend up at Cania. And I didn't want to go and sit in the middle of a school, in the middle of a pack and fish. So I just thought on my way to another spot, I'll go right around the outside. I was sitting in 60 feet of water and I just thought, well, look, I'll just see what's on the sounder and see if anything's there. 60 feet, my sounder lit up full, just stacked with bass, clicked it into neutral, turned it off, threw the electric down, and we had our limit in about 15 minutes. So I'm so glad I did that. We switched up from the blade and I went to my spoon and literally fished there for the rest of it and went and weighed in, weighed in 4.26, so not a big bag at all, but I was so happy after fishing all day for one fish with an hour or 40 minutes to go to get our four fish to fill our limit. And then we got a couple of upgrades too. I was so, so happy. And that was the end of the tournament. You know, it wasn't, I, as I said, I knew that what I was doing was going to be hard and a grind and it was going to be make or break. I knew that I had to make that decision to change from shallow to deep. Um, and I was just lucky, I guess, in the fact that I did what I did when I did and just smashed these fish. Ended up sitting in ninth place overall with like nine point something kilos. So that MJ ended up winning on literally just under 13 kilos, which is crazy. Really, really good weight. Now down to my tackle. What was I using? Really similar to St. Clair, guys. Really, actually, really similar, identical to St. Clair. I was fishing with my Akuma Helios HSS 701M. So the M stands for medium. It's a medium action rod, seven foot in the Helios range. It's really light, really responsive at the tip, but I'll, usually I like to fish the light when I fish blades and light plastics, but because I'm using that really aggressive rip action, the backbone in this is a lot further up than the light. And it's what you really need to really rip that blade really hard and fast up and out of that weed. So, which is why I went to the medium. Um, again, I was throwing my, uh, my 12 pound Siglon. Uh, it is only equivalent to about an eight pound diameter though. And I was using an eight pound fluorocarbon leader. What was I using? Sunline. I only use Sunline FC rock leader. I trust it. I was using the eight pound. There's not much they can wrap you in, but when they wrap you up in weed, it really sucks to get them out and you can lose some good fish, Assess, uh, uh, especially on the assist hooks from these blades. You know, if you get it side pinned and it gets stuck on the weed, it comes out pretty easily. So Helios rod, I was using my Helios HSX20 in uh, my spin reel, a 20 size perfect. Small, light, perfect for, for shallow water techniques and stuff like that. Um, I threw that all weekend. I threw it in pre-fish, day one, day two. That's just about the only bait, the only rod, reel combo. That's it. 
It's a bit of a workhorse combo of mine, this medium Helios rod and the Helios reels. I love it. They do anything and everything. They've stood up to the test this entire year and I could not be happier. Uh, the only other rod that I did use, again, on the medium, it's a 7 foot. I was throwing my uh, G2 gang banger spoon in the hot bite. Um, I was throwing it in the hollow maggot. And that, again, the only change up that I did is I was still throwing my Helios uh, 7 foot medium, but I was throwing a HSX 30 size reel, so it's a bit bigger, bigger spool, you can really fire those casts out there with like a 20 something gram lure, not afraid to get down and backing on the smaller spool size, so that's literally the only difference, and I only fished with that for about an hour, and did the damage, hollow maggot was the only colour that I had on, um, I found that whites in previous years out at Cania, whether it be plastics or whatever, did me well. So I tried to emulate that, especially with the bonies. They have big, big bonies at Cania, and uh, they look exactly like this colour. So I just tried to match the hatch, and it proved that it worked, whether I was vertical jigging it, casting it out, letting it hit the bottom, slow retrieve on that school, they were just absolutely smashing it. Um, that's about it, guys. That kind of wraps up the uh, Lake Cania, Lake Cania tournament. So, again, ninth place, I was hoping for better, but another top 10 off the back of a top 10 at St. Clair. I'm going good, sitting pretty for AOY. If I can just keep this up, I'd love to get a win under my belt, but I really want Angler of the Year. I'm thirsty, I'm hungry for Angler of the Year. So, that being said, Thank you for watching guys, if you like it make sure you give me a thumbs up and follow me on Instagram, YouTube and Facebook under Keegan Painter Fishing. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so I can keep on bringing videos like this to you, but right now I will see you next time which will be Lake Somerset, oh dear, Lake Somerset and I have a pretty, uh, it's not even a love hate, it's just hate hate. But We'll see what happens. If I can get another top 10 at Somerset, then uh, that's going to blow my mind. So, until then, I will see you later. Thanks for watching. I am out.